it is difficult to find words. These past months, my heart has been heavy with sorrow, each day's tragedies adding to the anguish. Punjab is uppermost in all our minds. The whole country is deeply concerned. The matter has been discussed and spoken about time and again, yet an impression has been assiduously created that it is not being dealt with. My colleagues and I have repeatedly explained in Parliament and outside government's readiness to accept all reasonable demands given to me by the Akali Dal when they met me before starting their agitation. But new demands continue to be pressed. Unfortunately, the leadership of the agitation appears to have been seized by a group of fanatics and terrorists whose instruments for achieving whatever they may have in view are murder, arson, and loot. Large-scale violence and terrorism grip the state. Let us look at these problems and issues in perspective. In 1981, the Akali Dal presented a large number of demands. As soon as we received their memorandum, I began a dialogue with them. Since then, the process of consultation and discussion has not been interrupted by government. From the very beginning, we regarded these issues as national issues, transcending narrow party interests. We took the opposition parties into confidence and associated them with the discussion in an effort to work out the solution that would command the widest acceptance. Throughout these discussions, our attitude was one of accommodation of all reasonable demands. Turmoil and violence in Punjab benefit no one except those who want to undermine the unity and integrity of India. It was against the background of these larger national considerations that we have been trying to evolve a consensus on the disputed claims and counterclaims. Why then, some people ask, has there been no final settlement? This question should legitimately be addressed to those who are unwilling to give up morchas and buns, wherever the demands did not affect the rights of other states or where they could be fitted into a wider framework, the government had no hesitation in accepting them. For example, the government accepted all Akali Dal demands generally referred to as religious and have initiated action to implement the decisions. The sale of tobacco, liquor, and meat within demarcated areas in the walled city of Amritsar has been banned. Government agreed to arrange for the direct relay of all India radio of the Kirtan from the Golden Temple. However, the Shiromani Gurdwara Prabandha Committee has so far denied facilities within the temple for such relay. Sikh passengers have been allowed to carry kirpans on domestic flights of a size agreed to between the representatives of the Akali Dal and government. The government also agreed to consider the formulation of an All India Gurdwara Bill for historical Gurdwaras in India and started discussions with various concerned parties. The demand for the amendment of Article 25 of the Constitution was not included in the original list. However, we did not wish to take a legalistic attitude. When this demand was presented belatedly, and even though it was backed by a highly reprehensible agitation of burning copies of the Constitution, government offered to consult the Shiromani Gurdwara Prabandha Committee and other representatives of the Sikh community, as well as legal experts and undertake such legislation by way of amendment of Article 25 b as may be necessary to remove doubts on this point. On the question of center-state relations, a high-level commission under Justice Ranjit Singh Sarkaria has already been established. We have informed the Akali Dal that they are free to present to it any submissions on this subject which fall within the terms of reference of the Commission. The two remaining demands involve the rights and claims of states other than Punjab. These relate to river waters and territories. 
on the river water issue, government agreed to refer the dispute between Punjab and Haryana on the surplus waters of the Ravi Vyas to a tribunal presided over by a Supreme Court judge. There was agreement on this at a tripartite meeting between government, representatives of the Akali Dal and of opposition parties. But the Akali Dal now seeks to reopen the decisions reached as early as 1955 regarding the sharing of waters with Rajasthan and has also raised the issue of the Yamuna waters. As regards territorial disputes, I have repeatedly stated that Chandigarh will go to Punjab provided Haryana gets its proper share of some Hindi-speaking areas which are now in Punjab. In spite of our best efforts, the two states have not been able to reach an agreement on the territories to be transferred. Government had suggested that the entire territorial dispute, including Chandigarh and Abhor Fazilka, could be referred to a commission whose decision should be binding on both states. Unfortunately, the Akali Dal has not accepted our suggestions regarding the transfer of areas to Haryana in view of Chandigarh or of reference of the whole dispute to a commission. I have spoken of the various demands of the Akali Dal and government stand on them in great detail, only to remove the impression which seems to persist among some people that government have not done enough to reach a settlement. May I ask in all seriousness, what more can any government do when disputes affect more than one state? The reality that has emerged is not the adequacy or otherwise of the terms of settlement offered by the government on the various Akali Dal demands, but the fact that the agitation is now in the hands of a few who have scant respect for the unity and integrity of our country. All concern for communal harmony or the continued economic progress of the Punjab. Every three or four months a new morcha is started and Punjab is torn by senseless and tragic strife. Terrorists and anti-national elements have gained the upper hand. Innocent people, Sikhs and Hindus have been killed. There is arson, looting and sabotage. Holy shrines have been turned into shelters for criminals and murderers. Their sanctity as places of worship has been undermined. A deliberate and systematic campaign is spreading bitterness and hatred between Hindus and Sikhs. And worst of all, the unity and integrity of our motherland is being openly challenged by a few who find refuge in holy shrines. This is Melville de Mello reporting from the Golden Temple Complex. The time is now exactly 13 minutes past five on the 8th of June. Over my shoulder you can see the Arminda Saheb Gurdwara and uh, the Ramdas uh, Sarova, which is the holy tank which uh, surrounds uh, this famous Gurdwara and uh, away on the left behind, which you can't see from this position, is the Akal Takht. Well, um, we've been here some time this afternoon and uh, you can see the surrounding buildings from which actually the action of winkling out took place by the army. And you can probably hear in the background, some of the snipers are still active. As we stand here, you can hear the uh, gunshots and the uh, Sten gun fire in replying. In reply, the president at the moment is in the Arminda Saheb and the um, Shabad Kirtan is in progress where we have been sitting for the last one hour and uh, things are very soon coming back to normalcy. Now uh, I'm standing on the south side of the uh, Harminda Saheb, Gurdwara Harminda Saheb, and uh, on the, what I would like to call an outer parikrama. And uh, you can see as you gaze at the uh, temple that there is absolutely no damage on the outside at all. In other words, it was uh, cared for very carefully by the uh, troops that were moving in here to carry out the operation and all respect was given to it and uh, its sanctity has been uh, observed throughout and uh, 
The president was there about uh, half an hour ago. स्वर्ण मंदिर के बाहर राष्ट्रपति जी ने मंदिर से मिले हथियारों को देखा The wounds are being healed. The sanctity has been restored. The nature of the attempted disruption of the unity of the country becomes clearer as the basements are cleared, manholes flushed, and a veritable arsenal of arms, ammunition, and sophisticated lethal weapons are dredged from the bowels of the buildings surrounding the Golden Temple. The dimension of the perfidy emerges in this interview with Major General Bra. General Bra, I'm going to start with a slightly surgical question. Um, most newspapers talk about you having stormed the Golden Temple. Would you like to put this straight for the record? There's no question of our having stormed the Golden Temple. In fact, we didn't even want to enter the Golden Temple. To put the record straight, I may tell you, that on the day that we actually entered the Golden Temple complex, that's on the 5th of June, sometime in the afternoon at about 4 o'clock, we sent out an appeal, a sincere appeal, to all the terrorists inside, a lot of innocent pilgrims inside, including women and children, to kindly come out and lay their arms. We did not want to use force against them at all. So the question of storming into the Golden Temple just doesn't arise. How do you regard these... Uh terrorists or extremists, how would you define them? What sort of people are they? That's a very awkward question. All I can say is that this, they were operating from the Golden Temple, which was the nerve center of crime instructions. They were sending out death warrants to people. They were ordering murders of innocent people all over the country. You can even, you can, you can still hear them firing outside the Golden Temple. Anyway, the fact is that every day there were large number of murders being committed all over the country under instructions from the Golden Temple. These terror, these. That's pretty clear. Yeah. These terrorists, I don't think, had regard for life at all. They were functioning from the Holy Shrine a place for worship, and yet they had converted this into an arsenal. They had converted it into a terrorist camp. If one goes around this place and sees the hundreds and thousands of weapons, munitions, explosives that they kept here, I'm sure you'll have no doubts in your mind as to what sort of people they were. What sort of foreign uh, infiltration was there, and uh, were you able to guess or assess from the arms that you captured as to any foreign country was assisting them in this uh, man of no, idea thing? I have no doubt in my mind that they have received foreign assistance. From some of the weapons that we've captured, we can see clearly the identification that, that we... We can clearly establish that these weapons have been obtained from China or Pakistan. They've got Chinese markings, and I'm sure they've been smuggled in through Pakistan. There are a large number of passports that we have come across of Pakistan. They have Khalistan passports with them. A large number of them appeared to me that they were Pakistanis. So I have no doubt in my mind that there has been some infiltration. In fact, just this morning, Two gentlemen dressed as Nihangs were trying to escape through our cordon when we opened fire on them. We killed them and recovered a weapon from them. 
These Nihangs on identification leave no doubt that they are Pakistanis. Their medical examination confirms this fact. Now, can you recap on that uh, fateful night when you went in at, I think, 10.30 at night? Uh, what sort of opposition did your boys receive from uh, these uh, highly entrenched individuals here, these terrorists? If I may say so, I think it was extreme opposition. We thought that they weren't going to give us such a stiff resistance. The intelligence that we had received earlier led us to believe that their resistance would be much less than what they actually offered us. When we came in, at about 10.30 at night, on the 5th of June, the battle started raging. Right at the entrance to the Golden Temple, the entire fortress was fortified. They had bunkers, emplacements, shelters on rooftops. They had converted all the windows into emplacements. They had converted doors into emplacements. They had underground tunnels from where they would appear. They would move from room to room. In fact, they had even converted manholes in some of the verandas as firing positions. They used to appear through these manholes, lob grenades, shoot at us with stand guns and other automatics, then disappear into the manhole, which connected them into a room. It was difficult to flush them out at night. They went to the extent of using the Akal Takht as a firing position. The Akal Takht had, had bunkers on the ground floor, bunkers which took on my troops at ground level. On both sides of the Akal Takht, they had emplacements and bunkers on the high-rise rooftops. Inside the Akal Takht, on all the floors, they had very fortified positions. In fact, it is revealing even now, when you go on to the second floor of the Akal Takht, that the floor is littered with thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition that they expended. I have a feeling that that was their last ditch stand. They put everything into it. It was do or die. And when they found that they had expended all their ammunition, when they found that they were now overpowered, they even went to the extent of blowing up some of the portion of the Akal Takht. This is evident from the large amount of explosives that we have found in that particular location. Even the Harmandar Saab, unfortunately and regrettably, was used by these terrorists to fire upon us. Whereas we used complete restraint. All troops were instructed that under no circumstances was any fire to be directed towards Harmandar Saab. The terrorists brought down effective fire on us from all directions, from the Harmandar Saab complex as well as other places. It was a very difficult task for my troops to restrain themselves from aiming towards the Harmandar Saab. And it's a wonderful feeling now to know that Harmandar Saab has been untouched by any of us. And in spite of the large number of casualties that we have suffered, our troops have maintained the discipline and self-control.